and it's good to, um, hopefully you had a good night's rest and prepare to uh, have a time of uh, a fellowship, but also study around the Word of God as we continue our Sola Conference this morning. Our first speaker this morning is Pastor Patrick Hines. Pastor Hines is the uh, lead teaching elder at Bridwell Heights Presbyterian Church in Tennessee. He did his seminary training at RTS Jackson. He has been involved in several or various evangelical outreaches and is the author of several books, some of which are back there on the table. Um, so you would want to uh, check those out. And again, as <clears throat> I revealed uh, yesterday, I saw a little bit of my weakness if Make sure you get the books you want. So um, give everybody an opportunity to do that. Uh, Patrick also hosts a weekly uh, live podcast on, it is found, can be found it on YouTube at, called the, the YouTube channel is Christian Sermons and Audio Books. And he is live every Thursday at 3 p.m. So if you have an opportunity and you're sitting in front of your computer, you can pull that up on Thursday at 3 p.m. and you can hear Patrick and um, uh, really begin going into various theological discussions and uh, doctrinal topics. And he just started recently, and some of you have seen this, the Christ Reformed Presbyterian Church podcast, and it's a weekly, typically a weekly podcast that they are currently working on going through the Westminster Confession of Faith. I've not had the opportunity or the privilege to get on that yet, but the the gentlemen that are doing it, Patrick and Henry and Jim, so far has been really, really good. I encourage you to go and listen to those as well. They touch on a lot of of the controversies and just general interest in those chapters. Beloved, Patrick is also married to his wife, Amy, and have 10 children. We are very delighted to have Patrick come and open up the doctrine of solo fide. Brother, come on up. Good morning. Uh, is, the, is the earpiece on? You getting it? Okay. All right. Let's pray together, please. But gracious Lord and God, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word, and we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are justified by faith alone and not by working, not by doing, not by obedience, not for anything wrought in us or done by us, but for Christ's sake alone. Uh, so be with us now during this time. Help us to glorify you in our attentiveness, and we thank you for the great Reformation. We thank you for those that went before the Reformation who uh, brought forward these glorious truths, and uh, we thank you for the purity of your word and the gospel uh, of our dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Bible's in turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, I'm going to read 1 through 8, and uh, walking through those eight verses will form the last part of my uh, address to you here this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about the historical controversy over justification by faith alone. We're going to talk, uh, secondly, about God's holiness and the trauma of God's holiness and how that relates to justification by faith alone. And then we're going to walk through, verse by verse, Romans 4, 1 to 8. But I'd like to read this in your hearing first. This is God's word. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. The historical controversy over the gospel and some key passages of scripture. 
Presbyterians are confessionally bound to all five of the great solas. If you believe the Westminster standards, you have to believe in all five of the solas. And what this means is that every Presbyterian minister, when they take their ordination vows, are required to affirm that justification before God is by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone, as revealed by Scripture alone, and all for the glory of God alone. And wouldn't it be great if everyone really did believe that, that said they believed this confession? Question 33 of the Shorter Catechism asks the question, what is justification? Answer, justification is an act. It's not a process. It's not a work. It is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. The Roman Catholic Church responded very strongly, very negatively, to the doctrines of the Protestant Reformation, and they called a a council in the city of Trent in northern Italy, you've already heard references to it from Brother Jess and Brother Henry, the Council of Trent met on and, on and off for a, a period of 18 years. We think our meetings are kind of long. 18 years off and on, and there were gaps where there were wars going on, and they didn't meet for a couple years at a time, but a total of 18 years they spent examining the doctrines of the Protestant Reformation. And when the gavel came down to close the final session of the Council of Trent in 1564, the Roman Catholic Church declared that the gospel of Jesus Christ, foreshadowed in the Old Testament scriptures, proclaimed by the apostles and prophets, revealed in and by Christ, was actually heretical. Rome pronounced numerous condemnations upon the Protestant and Lutheran and Reformed heretics, as they saw them, which all end uh, with the phrase taken from Galatians 1, let them be anathema. And that phrase refers to the eternal condemnation of God. Those who die under the curse of God's law uh, will go into everlasting hell fire. Roman Catholicism has affirmed all of these anathemas from the Council of Trent. Every pope that has ever sat on the chair of Peter since the Council of Trent, all the way through Pope John Paul II in my lifetime, Pope Benedict XVI, and now Pope Francis has had to affirm every one of these. They have never been repented of, changed, modified, or deleted. So I want to read a few of these to you. Canon 9, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, let him be anathema. That takes care of every professing evangelical on this planet. Canon 11, if anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the righteousness of Christ or by the sole remission of sins, let him be anathema. Canon 12, if anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that it is this confidence alone that justifies us, let him be anathema. Y'all need to feel the force of that. If you're trusting in the finished work of Christ to get you into heaven, Rome says, you're damned. Canon 16, if anyone says he will for certain, with absolute and infallible certainty, have that great gift of perseverance even to the end, unless he shall have learned this by a special revelation, let him be anathema. Canon 24, if anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that these good works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of the increase, let him be anathema. So if you believe that your good works are the fruit of your salvation, not the cause of getting into heaven, Rome says you're lost. Just a couple more, Canon 30. If anyone says that after the reception of the grace of justification, the guilt is so remitted and the debt of eternal punishment so blotted out to every repentant sinner that no debt of temporal punishment remains to be discharged either in this world or in purgatory before the gates of heaven can be opened, let him be anathema. So if you don't believe in purgatory, you're lost. Canon 32. If anyone says that the good works of the one justified are in such manner the gifts of God that they are not also the good merits of him justified, or that the one justified by the good works that he performs, by the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, does not truly merit an increase of grace and eternal life, 
let him be anathema. So unless you believe that you merit eternal life by your good works, you're lost. It was therefore not the Protestant reformers who were condemned by Rome in 1564, but the very gospel itself. The good news, the good news that relying upon Christ's work is sufficient to save us was judged by Rome to be so erroneous that anyone who believed it was assured of their own eternal damnation to hell. The one true gospel has always divided true believers from false professors. Indeed, in what is perhaps the most heated letter of God-breathed scripture in the canon, Galatians, Paul describes his opponents who taught uh, a false gospel. He describes them as false brethren. These are people who said that they did believe in Jesus, as was uh, spelled out by Henry last night. Galatians 2.4, Paul says, and this occurred, this, this disturbance, this false gospel occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty that we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So are there people who profess to be Christians who actually are not Christians? Oh, yes, lots of them. Uh, there were in Paul's day, and there certainly are in our day. What's the difference between a true brother and a false brother? What gospel they believe. You see, even in the days of the apostles, there were lots of other gospels, lots of other Jesuses, lots of other spirits running around. And Paul warned the church at Corinth about all of them. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, the Holy Spirit through Paul says, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, you guys are so lacking in discernment, you might, you might even put up with another Jesus, another spirit, a different gospel. Paul and the other New Testament writers were well aware of the false doctrine that was on the rise even in their own lifetimes in the churches they planted. Jude said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And how great is the need to contend earnestly today? We have the church doing everything except the gospel. The church pushing global warming, and we need to be environmental activists because we love our neighbor. You know, we need to try to get the gospel. How about we get the gospel right first? Wouldn't that be better? That's really what the world needs, is that. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul, right out of the gate, he tells them, it was quoted last night, I'm astonished. He was shocked. He was shocked. Uh, Leon Morris dates the book of Galatians between 48 and 52 AD. These are, this is a whole region of churches. Paul says, I, I can't believe how quickly this happened. How did you turn away so quickly from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, as if there could be a bunch of different gospels. There's only one. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert, want to change the gospel of Christ. And then he says the same thing twice in a row, just to make sure if someone was nodding off in the list of this letter that they would catch it the second time. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be anathema let him be accursed as we have said before so now i say again if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received let him be accursed and so it's very important that we know what the gospel is if it's that important if it's that serious we need to know what it is other jesus's other spirits other gospels which mimic christianity have existed in every decade in every century of the church's entire existence. They were commonplace during the lives of the apostles themselves. They are commonplace today. Opposing and fighting those false gospels, denouncing them and protecting the sheep of Christ from them is the task of all shepherds and elders in Jesus's church. And we do not need reformed celebrities to tell us if something's wrong. Is this really how the church has to spend her life on earth? Fighting, contending, contending, 
weeding out false teachers, false doctrine, defending the blessed gospel from all of its false competitors, identifying people as false brethren who say they are Christians and they're not. Well, I got bad news. Yeah, it is. We have to do that all the time. If we take scripture seriously, we have to do that all the time. Always be vigilant. You can never let your guard down. You never get to the point, okay, we finally we finally rid it, rid the church of all this bad stuff. Now we're good to go. We can relax. You can't. Commenting on Paul's statement in 2 Timothy 3.13 when he says that wicked men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. John Calvin wrote this. He wrote a sentence I wish every pastor had plastered to the door of their study that they would slap on their way out of their study to the pulpit. He said, it is highly necessary for godly teachers to be reminded of this, that they may be prepared for uninterrupted warfare and may not be discouraged by delay or yield to the haughtiness and insolence of adversaries, end quote. Think about that. The haughtiness and insolence of adversaries. The enemies of Jesus Christ are smug, arrogant, smart mouth, cheeky. They have sharp, witty tongues, and they're full of themselves. They always have been. Listen to the Holy Spirit's description of them. Second Peter chapter 2, 17. Listen to the Holy Spirit. These are springs without water and mist driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved for speaking out arrogant words of vanity. They entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who have barely escaped from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. And then Jude, verse 16, these are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of dishonest gain. There are new Judaizers today. There's lots of them today. The new perspective writers like N.T. Wright, all of the Federal Visionist writers, Steve Wilkins, Lightheart, Rich Lust, Doug Wilson, Steve Schlissel, and there's another, another group, John Piper and his friends. The names change, the nuances change, but it's always a rehashing of the same old thing. Listen to N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright, uh, in his uh, book called The Day the Revolution Began, he wrote this, quote, We have paganized our soteriology, our doctrine of salvation, our understanding of salvation, substituting the idea of God killing Jesus to satisfy his wrath for the genuinely biblical notions we're about to explore in my book. The idea that Jesus Christ died in the place of sinners, N.T. Wright says about that, quote, is closer to the pagan idea of an angry deity being pacified by human death than they are to anything in either in Israel scripture or the New Testament. Wright rejects the concept of Christ satisfying divine justice against sin on the cross entirely. He has no substitutionary atonement at all, none in his theology. There is no justice satisfying death of Christ in Wright's theology. He denies that our sins are imputed to Christ. He denies that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. He says this, quote, if we use the language of the law court, it makes no sense whatsoever to say that the judge imputes, imparts, bequeaths, conveys, or otherwise transfers his righteousness to either the plaintiff or the defendant. Righteousness is not a substance, an object, or a gas which can be passed across a courtroom. This gives the impression of a legal transaction, a kind of cold piece of business, almost a trick of thought performed by a God who is logical and correct, but hardly one we want to worship, end quote. And there are reformed men who aren't sure if Wright's a good guy or a bad guy. He also said this, quote, his words, I must stress again that the doctrine of justification by faith is not what Paul means by the gospel. The gospel is not an account of how people get saved, end quote. I remember reading that and I thought, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel by which you are saved. As one uh, critic of right said, N.T. right is N.T. wrong. John Piper preached a sermon in 2017 on justification. He's had numerous articles on Desiring God's website on the same issue. In response to the question, is an article titled, Does God Really Save Us by Faith Alone? And his answer is a clear and emphatic 
No. Piper has introduced a separate, distinct, forensic act of God that he calls final salvation. Listen to his own words. This is a quotation from Piper. Quote, In justification, faith receives a finished work of Christ performed outside of us and counted as ours, imputed to us. That sounds good. In sanctification, faith receives an ongoing power of Christ that works inside us for practical holiness. In final salvation, at the last judgment, faith is confirmed by the sanctifying fruit it has borne, and we are saved through that fruit and that faith. And then he says, these are his words, So, we should not speak of getting to heaven by faith alone, in the same way we are justified by faith alone. End quote. That's the clearest denial of the gospel I've ever heard. Piper says, we're saved at the last judgment by our works, by our fruit. God says in Ephesians 2, we're saved by faith, not by works. Not by fruit, lest anyone should boast. Now, we could multiply quotations. We could do several conferences just multiplying quotations from many authors. But it's important that we look at Scripture and hear from God. There are many doctrines of the Christian faith that, you know, you can get them wrong and still be a Christian. But the gospel is not one of them. How sinners are justified before God is not one of those things you can get wrong. Err on what you're trusting in to get into heaven, and you've lost everything, your soul and heaven. Err on the gospel, and it doesn't matter where else you're right. You're not a Christian. The greatest enemies of the Christian church and Christian faith and of the gospel who have done the most damage to the church have always been ordained ministers inside the church. Not outside. Acts 20:29. 20, Paul said to, to his one of his the churches he spent the most time at, the church at Ephesus, he told them in Acts 20:29, 20, For I know this that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. What an amazing passage. We're told that false teachers will come from inside the church, from among yourselves. And we're told that they'll speak perverse things. And why will they do this? To draw disciples after themselves. They innovate and bring in crooked and perverse doctrine, not to edify or help or build up or encourage Christ's sheep, but simply because they want followers. They'll speak perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. They want something that's personality-driven, not Bible-driven. They want something that's marketed well, not gospel-driven. So there you go. I mean, the, the things in Scripture about our need to be vigilant on the solas in general, but especially sola fide, that we're justified by faith and not by works, uh, it's from front to back in the Bible. We have to take those warnings seriously, and we have to stay vigilant and watch out for the subtleties of speech and the smooth words of flattery and the redefinitions of terms and also the contradictions. First Timothy 6.20, Paul told Timothy, watch out. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care, and watch out for the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. You see, if a person contradicts themselves a lot, they can accuse all their critics, rightly accuse all their critics of misrepresenting them. If I say, well, we're justified by, by a living faith that, that is suffused and infused with works, but, but, but we're justified by faith alone, no matter how I criticize that person, he can say, well, you're misrepresenting me. You're missing out because I said it this way over here, and I said it that way over there. One of the marks of a good teacher is the clarity that they bring to their topics. Faith alone and the holiness of God, the trauma of God's holiness. When Adam and Eve first sinned, when they knew God was approaching, they immediately did what? They hid. Why? They were scared. They were afraid of God. In Mark chapter 4, when Jesus and his disciples were on a boat about to be destroyed by a violent storm, they were terrified of the storm. And the disciples wake Jesus up when they say, don't you care that we're perishing? Remember, Jesus stands up, quiet, be still. And then the wind dies down and it's completely calm. And the disciples' reaction is recorded in Mark 4, 41. It says, they were terrified. Isn't that amazing? 
they, they're more afraid of the one who calmed the storm than a storm that was about to kill them. Why? Because they knew they were in the presence of God. They were terrified. When Jesus first meets Peter, after he'd been fishing for an entire night and caught nothing, Jesus comes up to the shore, put out into the deep water and let your nets out again for a catch. And Peter is so annoyed by this. He says, we've been fishing all night long and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And so many fish are drawn up that it's about to sink two boats. Remember Peter's reaction? I know my reaction would have been like, let's sign the guy up for a fishing contract. What does Peter say? Go away from me. Go away from me. For I am a sinful man. Dear ones, we've got to pray that God will do this to people again. Until God does this to the people in our communities, in our pews, in our churches, we're not going to see a revival. We are totally, totally dependent on God to convict people of their sins in this way. And if he doesn't do that, they're not going to see their need. They're, they're going to hear justification by faith alone and say, well, that's a nice Reformation slogan. Let's get it tattooed on our, on our Bibles or something like that. They're not going to see their personal need for it. When Moses requested to see the glory of God on Mount Sinai, the divine response was, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. When Jacob wrestled all night long with the angel of the Lord and finally realized who it was, he said, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. When Samson's parents speak with the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate God, Christ, Manoah, Samson's father says, we shall surely die because we've seen God. When Isaiah has this vision of the holy, holy, holy God exalted on his throne in Isaiah 6, he says, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What exactly were these people experiencing in these moments? We all feel safe right now, don't we? I mean, as I'm standing here preaching, I don't feel like God's a threat to me. Don't you feel relatively safe right now if you're watching at home or whatever? You think God's a threat to you? Every human being that God ever drew near to in both Testaments, every time that happened, they thought they were going to die. God's holiness is dangerous, terrifying, traumatizing to fallen, sinful human beings. When a sinner grasps the fact that the all-knowing and all-holy God can see right through them into their thoughts, their motives, their secrets, they are brought to spiritual desolation. This is what our Lord taught in the first grand sermon he ever preached. Who would ever have thought that God incarnate in his first grand opportunity to speak to a multitude of people, the very first thing that he said Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Indeed, the Lord Jesus taught that the Holy Spirit of God was sent into the world to convict the world of sin in John 16, 8. When we see ourselves for what we truly are, and we see God in all of his holiness, all we can do is proclaim we have no spiritual goods. We are poor and we mourn over our sin and we hunger and thirst for righteousness and we beg for mercy and forgiveness. When the Holy Spirit convinces people of their sin and misery, then and only then are we ready for the glorious sweetness of his gospel. We are saved by relying upon Christ alone, trusting in Christ alone. He, by his suffering and his death, has indeed, Dr. Wright, satisfied divine justice that is due to us. You know, when I read what St. Paul really said, I, I got that book from the public library in 2004, N.T. Wright's book. Uh, there was a glowing endorsement of it written uh, in World Magazine years ago in, when it first came out in 1997. I, I got the book from the public library, read it, and dropped it back off at the public library, and I thought, this man has never experienced a day of his life where he felt the sin. And his whole understanding of Christianity can be what it is had Jesus of Nazareth never lived, died, or rose from the dead. And it was shocking to me to see, well, we're not really sure what to do with him. What do you mean you're not sure? What to do? The guy doesn't even believe Jesus died for our sins. R.C. Sproul was asked that question once at a conference. Is N.T. Wright's view of the gospel heresy? You remember what Sproul said? He said, 
If it isn't, then there's no such thing as heresy. And you hear the whole crowd go, ooh. He, by his suffering and death, has satisfied the holiness of God against me, and he, by his perfect law-keeping righteousness, has once and forever made me right with God. Nothing can ever be added to this great work that he did for me, and now I want to live for him every moment from now on until I die to go to be with him. The Word of God says, Galatians 3.22, The Scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ may be given to those who believe. Not to those who work, but to those who believe. Romans 3.19, We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world made guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law comes the knowledge of sin. You have this notion that at the final judgment, everyone's going to be ready to make their excuses, to make their plea, and the divine hand shuts every mouth. You have nothing you can say. It's either Christ alone or you're lost. If you repent and trust in Jesus alone to save you, if you make a decided, a decided decision out of the Savior business, and rely upon the Savior alone, then and only then can you be justified before God. Listen, why is that slogan so important to us? Sola fide. I've got it. I was speaking of it. It's in my Bible, my Bible cover, see? Sola fide. Why is that so important? Justification is by faith alone because justification is by the righteousness of Christ alone. Because only the righteousness of Christ can meet the requirement of the traumatizing, perfect holiness of God. That's why the word alone is so critical. It's not about, you know, rah, rah for the Protestants, sola fide. It's about the only righteousness that can satisfy God's requirement is that righteousness that was achieved and performed by Jesus Christ and by Jesus Christ alone. And anyone who dies relying upon anything other than Christ, anything in addition to Christ, anything alongside of Christ, Christ will be of no benefit to them. And they will die in their sins under God's just condemnation. And that's why all of the false teaching going on today, so it's still, it's been emanating for 22 years from the Federal Vision Movement, trying to include works inside of what faith is. D d redefining faith as obedience. Faith is works. Okay, but, but do the syllogism. We're justified by faith alone. Faith is works. We're justified by works. That's a false gospel, isn't it? Isn't that easy? Paul said in Galatians 5, Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, if you become circumcised, if you guys believe this false gospel, if you get circumcised, if you do anything thinking, that helps make you right with God. Christ will profit you nothing. I, again, I testify to every man who receives circumcision, every man who tries to add anything to what saving faith is except reliance upon Christ, anyone who has anything alongside of Christ that you're relying on or trusting in, I testify to every man who receives circumcision, he is under obligation to keep the whole law. There are only two ways before you. Either you save yourself by yourself, by your obedience, or you rely on Christ alone. If you say, oh, no, no, I, I, I believe in Jesus, but you add anything to him, he's out of the equation, and it's you and your works alone. And believe me, you don't want to die like that. You will be lost. Why did the Holy Spirit guide Paul to write that in Galatians? And why did Paul believe, love, and preach this truth with such ferocious passion? What's the big deal? Hey, these people believed in Jesus. They, they, they just added one little thing to that, just ritual circumcision. And Paul says, says, if you add one thing to simple belief in Christ as the means of being right with God, as the means of your justification, as the means of being saved and getting into heaven, Christ will profit you nothing. Christ will be of no benefit to you because if you're relying upon anything other than Christ, in addition to Christ or alongside of Christ, you are saying by that that he's not enough. You're saying that what he did at the cross and his righteousness is not sufficient to do it. Long ago, I remember meeting over a period of months. We'd meet at, at Panera with a young man, trying to lead him to uh, Christ. And this concept here of Christ alone, faith alone and Christ alone, and these passages, these very passages I've already read to you, 
that finally the lights went on. I remember when it finally happened. And he leaned back in his chair and he said, yeah, if I thought that something I did was decisive, if, if I thought something I did contributed to getting into heaven, th then I would be saying that what Jesus did is not enough. And I wanted to jump up on the table and dance. I've been trying to get him to see that for a long time. It finally clicked. It was just glorious. Listen to Paul. Paul had such a burden for Israel. In Romans 10, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. This guy, I think, when he woke up in the morning, saved Israel. Lord, save my Jewish brothers. Save the Pharisees. Save my people. And he says to the, to the church in Rome, in verse 2 of Romans 10, For I testify about them, they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Folks, that's what all, all heretical gospels do this. Ignorance that it's only God's righteousness that can justify us and always seeking to establish their own. Paul prayed for them, Lord, save them. Isn't that amazing? He's saying, they're not saved. They're not saved. If you're not trusting only in Christ's righteousness, you're not saved. They're being lost on their way to hell. It burdened them greatly. And he begged God to save them. I ask you all in our day of ironic, peaceful coexistence and tolerance and everything else, is that arrogant to think of yourself as saved and to think of others as hellbound? Is that arrogant? No, it's humble. Why were they lost? Why are so many lost? They're ignorant of God's righteousness. They don't understand who God is. They don't understand what his law really requires. And because of that, they're seeking to establish their own righteousness. They're just like the Jews that Paul prayed for there. They don't understand that only Christ's righteousness can justify and save them from God's wrath. And because they're ignorant of that, they're trying to establish their own righteousness. They're trying to do good works, observe religious rituals to save themselves. And Paul wept over them. Earlier in Romans 9, he says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit. I have continual grief and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And do you not feel that same pain for lost loved ones, lost children, lost friends, coworkers, neighbors, family? We long for our own loved ones to be saved too. They too are ignorant of God's righteousness. They are ignorant of God's holiness. They, they really think that they're good people, that they're good enough for God because they don't know who God is. Ignorant of how deep sin is. Thus they don't see. They don't see in Jesus Christ's personal righteousness their only hope of going to heaven. They don't see that they need Christ's righteousness to be imputed, transferred, credited to their legal account before God to be justified. Now, if you still got your Bible open there to Romans 4, let's look at verse 1 and 2 there. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Stop there. The first key principle that Paul hammers here is this, and you can't miss it. If our works form any part of the grounds of our justification before God, then we would most certainly boast. We would most certainly boast. If our works play a decisive role, in any way, in getting us into heaven. Of course, the way this new false teaching is being done. Oh, no, 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 it's just, we're justified by faith alone. And then at the final judgment, there is an eschatological vindication of the reality of our faith by our works. And our works are spread out before us to see if there's enough to convict us of having saved faith. Folks, that's the Galatian heresy restated. That's all it is. If our works are decisive, we can boast. And Paul says numerous times, no one can boast. When it comes to being right with God, we're saved by grace, through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Where is boasting then? He says in Romans 3.27, it is excluded. <clears throat> Abraham, if he had been justified by works, then he would have something to boast about, but not before God. And then he cites Genesis 15.6, see verse 3, Romans 4.3. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what did Abraham do? Were there great works of charity and almsgiving and piety and personal holiness? No, he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham went from being an unbeliever 
to truly believing the promise of God. And Paul makes the point, this is hundreds of years, 400 plus years before the law was ever given at Mount Sinai. It was also before his circumcision. It was faith in the promise of God alone. That's how he was justified. And it says, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that Greek term that's translated as accounted means to impute, to reckon, to consider. When the repentant sinner believes, God legally accounts that person as righteous in his sight. It is exactly like a judge who has heard all the evidence in a case, and then he asks the defendant to rise to hear their verdict, and the judge says, you are justified and not guilty. That verdict, does it change the defendant subjectively inwardly? No, it's only a pronouncement made about his status. Remember, it was brought out uh, last night that Rome confuses justification and sanctification. In fact, they define justification as the sanctification and renewal of the inward man. It's not. Justification is solely and only a forensic legal act of God, whereby he changes our status before his law from condemned to justified. Upon what basis? Christ's death satisfies the justice due to us by that law, and his righteousness is imputed legally to our account before God so that we are seen as if we had always kept God's commandments and had never sinned. It is an act once, never to be repeated. It's not a process, it's an act. Now look at verse 4 and 5. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the wicked, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And verse 4 states clearly that the wages we receive for doing work are not counted as grace, but as debt. When you go to your job and, and do a week's work and your, your boss gives you your paycheck, that's not grace. You've earned that money. But when it comes to getting into heaven, it's to the person who does not work for it, but believes instead. Paul said in Romans 11:6 that if it is by grace, it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. Rome and all of man's false versions of Christianity, they try to mix what cannot be mixed. You cannot mix works with grace and it still be grace. If it's grace, it's not works, otherwise grace isn't grace. Works are the fruit, the evidence of our salvation. They form no part of the basis of it. Now listen, who does God justify? Who does God justify according to the Bible? Who does God justify according to Roman Catholicism? Listen carefully. Who does God justify? Rome says God only justifies those who work hard for it. Paul says God only justifies those who do not work for it. Rome says eternal life is earned by lifelong cooperation with infused grace and good works. Paul says eternal life is a gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Rome says God will only justify those who are inherently righteous. Paul says God only justifies those who are inherently unrighteous, wicked, ungodly. Rome's position is so much the opposite, the diametric opposite of what the apostle wrote here. Now look at verses 6 through 8. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And then he cites from Psalm 32, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Okay, now stop here for a moment. This is very important. From the time of the 16th century forward, the Roman Catholic theologians, apologists, have actually called the biblical and Protestant doctrine of justification, they call it a legal fiction. They argue that our doctrine actually makes God a liar because God is pretending that we're righteous when we're, in fact, still evil. <clears throat> in Scripture, Paul uses the concept of legal imputation to show how God is able to do this and still be just in doing it. The justification of sinners before God is literally the opposite of a legal fiction. This is because Jesus' sufferings on the cross were real. It was not fictitious. He really was nailed to a cross for our sins. The guilt and the punishment and the cause of the wrath was legally charged to Jesus in reality. His sufferings are real. They're not imaginary. Jesus is a state of humiliation. It was 
worse than any of us are capable of imagining, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, the curse of death of the cross, and being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time. Is anything about that a fiction? No, it really happened. And when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he did not intrinsically become evil. He remained sinlessly perfect throughout, inwardly, morally, but he was legally perfect. He had committed all of our adultery all of our lying, all of our pride and envy, all of our bad motives. Legally treated that way. Legally treated as a sinner. Second Corinthians 5.21, couldn't be clearer. God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin in our behalf. That's the cross. That's legal imputation. That we would become the righteousness of God in him. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, in behalf of us. Jesus Christ's righteousness, which he achieved by his perfect obedience to the Ten Commandments, that righteousness is also not fictitious. It is real. It is just as real as our sin. Look at Romans 4.6 again. You see it? Verse 6, the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. I have a question for you. Are you the blessed man? Are you the blessed man? Is that you? I hope you can see the utter folly of believing that our works, our righteousness could ever in any way play any role in getting us into heaven, any role at all in our justification, any role in our being saved from the wrath of God at the last day. The whole reason for the incarnation, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was this. If God would show us love and mercy, our works cannot possibly play any part of our getting into heaven. The moment that Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, justification by works ceased to be possible. God's perfect holiness will not allow it. Only a perfect righteousness will satisfy God's requirement. And the only righteousness that has the merit necessary to meet the requirement of that holy God's law is that righteousness that was achieved by Christ alone. Paul says in Galatians 2.21, I do not set aside the grace of God. I don't nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. If we could get into heaven, if our works could play some decisive role in getting us into heaven, Jesus didn't need to come. He didn't need to die. He died in vain. So if your doctrine makes the death of Jesus superfluous in vain, your doctrine is wrong. Christians call Jesus their Lord and their Savior because it's Jesus who has saved us by his cross and his righteousness alone. That's why we call him our Savior. He's the one who does the saving. He's not a cheerleader, a therapist, or a coach. He's the Savior. Abraham did not work, but believed, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It seems that one of the great mistakes that the church falls into almost constantly, as the book of Galatians demonstrates so clearly, is trying to find a way, trying to find a way to mix works with grace when it comes to salvation. In closing, I want you to jump down a few verses. Look at verse 14 of Romans 4. <clears throat> Paul says there, by the Holy Spirit, For if those who are of the law are heirs... Faith is made void and the promise is nullified. What does he mean by heirs there? Those who are of the law are heirs. If those who are trying to work for it are heirs of eternal life, if they're actually going to go to heaven, faith is void and the promise is nullified. Paul is saying, God is saying through Paul here, if people who are trying to get into heaven in some way by their works, if they're actually going to be heirs of eternal life, faith is void and the promise is nullified. God promised Abram long ago in Genesis 15, 6, that his spiritual descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the heavens. God promised that. That is God's promise to save all of his elect people by the work of Christ. And that is precisely what God did. All of God was never to be the means of our salvation. Our works cannot be the means of our salvation. The law's primary purpose was to show mankind his sinfulness so that man would rest solely upon the mercy of God in Christ. The law is holy. The law is just. The law is good. It's a blessing. Please listen carefully. When it comes to how sinners get into heaven after they die, the law is of no saving value to us whatsoever. Verse 15 tells us why. You see it? 
Verse 15, for the law brings about wrath. If you die saying, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. I, I believe in justification by faith alone. But what do you think faith is? Faith includes my works. Wrath is what's awaiting you. All who attempt to be saved by their law keeping by their good works are under God's wrath. Why? Because by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. And if you become circumcised, if you believe your works are decisive, Christ will profit you nothing and you're a debtor to keep the whole law and you're severed from Christ. Paul was so vehement, so passionate about this. Jesus was passionate about it. Isaiah was passionate about it. Ezekiel was passionate about it. Peter was passionate about it. Our sin makes keeping the law of God to the satisfaction of his holiness impossible. And that's why our salvation is based entirely upon grace alone. You see the summary in verse 16? You see verse 16 there? For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. Listen, if our works are decisive, it's not grace then. Therefore, justification is by faith so that it would be by grace. can't be by works, can't be by law keeping, can't be by anything wrought in us or done by us, but only on Christ's righteousness alone. And look at the rest of verse 16. It's glorious. So that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants. Not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Really? Salvation is guaranteed? It's guaranteed, he says. Because salvation and heaven are achieved by Christ alone, and we simply rest upon him alone to receive it. It's guaranteed. It's sure. It's certain. The same Greek term is used in Hebrews 6.19 to say, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Guaranteed. God's promise to save his people is absolutely firm. It's guaranteed and steadfast because it's by faith alone, grace alone. What is faith in Jesus Christ? That's a key question. Thankfully, we have wonderful definitions of it. It's very clear in Scripture. It's clear in our confessional standards. Listen, please. L please hear me. Faith is not obedience and does not include obedience. Faith is not works and does not include works. In fact, faith excludes works entirely. Remember that passage we just read, Romans 4, 4, and 5? to the one not working but believing. To the one not working but believing. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Federal vision, false doctrine for 22 years has been saying faith is works. Faith is obedience. The United Reformed Church addressed the federal vision heresies on the gospel back in 2007 and they published a nine-point statement. And point number eight is just perfect, the way they worded it. Listen to this. The synod rejects the errors of those who define faith in the act of justification as being anything more than leaning and resting on the sole obedience of Christ crucified. You can't define faith as anything more than that. Federal vision, <laughs> heresy, and heretics, they define faith as obedience. They say that works are not the fruit of faith. They're, they're what faith is. They're included inside of what faith is. That's a false gospel. Plain. They teach faith doesn't bear the fruit of good works, but that faith is good works. Justified by faith, right? Well, faith, if faith is good works, then we're justified by works, and that's false. To the one not working but believing. By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. We're saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. I've had so many people, both in person and through email, electronically, over the years, they hear this teaching, <clears throat> sola fide, biblical gospel of a free salvation apart from works. So they almost act like it's a new doctrine. Like, what is this new teaching you're bringing? <laughs> like, it's just the old gospel. They say, so you, you personally are convinced. You, you really believe you're going to go to heaven when you die? I say, yeah, I am convinced of that. First John 13, I know I have eternal life. These things are written so you can know you have eternal life. And so many people say, well, how arrogant are you? How full of yourself you must be to think you're going to heaven. To which it's a joy to respond, I know I'm going to heaven because God justified me by faith alone in Christ alone. I know I'm going to heaven because it does not depend in any way, shape, or form on how good I am, how faithful I am, or any works I have done. 
And if it did, I wouldn't have any assurance of eternal life. When we say that we're justified by faith alone, that is shorthand for we're justified by the righteousness of Christ alone. When I think about death, and I think about it a lot, I think about death, my confidence for getting past that final judgment is in Jesus Christ's righteousness alone. Well, what about your works? What about, what about your fruit? What about that? Um, that'll be judged for rewards. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has nothing to do with getting me into heaven. Nothing at all. Justification is by faith. Faith is simply relying upon Christ, his personal righteousness. And if we're relying on anything we have done in addition to him, all we're demonstrating is we don't really believe in Jesus. Martin Luther <clears throat> said that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is the doctrinal article by which the Christian church stands or falls. Why did he say that? He said that because justification by faith alone is the doctrinal article by which we stand or fall eternally. In closing, I want you to listen to the words of a hymn that captures this so beautifully. This was written by former slave trader John Newton, a man who really understood grace, a man who would have laughed at the idea that his faith in Christ included his works or, or any nonsense like that. Listen to these two stanzas. Let us love and sing and wonder. Let us praise the Savior's name. He has hushed the law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. He has washed us with his blood. He has brought us nigh to God. Let us wonder, grace and justice join and point to mercy's store when through grace in Christ our trust is, justice smiles and asks no more. He who washed us with his blood has secured our way to God. Justification is by faith alone. Faith is not working. It's not obedience. Faith is relying on Christ alone. We're justified by faith alone because we're justified by the righteousness and work of Christ alone. Let's pray. A gracious Lord and God, we bless your name for the good news that truly is good news. And we pray you would close the mouths of those who claim to preach good news but are not bearers of good news but are bearers of bondage. And we pray that the pure and pristine gospel that we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone on the basis of his cross work alone and his imputed personal righteousness to our legal account alone, that that would be preached again in this nation and that you, Holy Spirit, would cut through the fallowed ground of the hearts of men and show them their need for redemption, their need to be justified by Christ's righteousness, their need to pronounce a curse upon themselves and their works. And we pray that this glorious message would be heard again in this nation and that you would bring about a great revival, that we would put aside the, the peripheral issues and the distractions and get back to this basic, glorious, wonderful message, these good tidings of great joy to all men. And we pray that it would be believed, that we would see revival, that we would see repentance, and that we would see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.